hunk of piece there of information. Um, so then what happens is that when we depart from that absolute moral truth, the consequence becomes something that the enemy sets up the environment for him to be able to get into. So Antichrist will come at a time when there's, as it said in this poll, one out of two Christians believe there's no moral absolute truth, according to Barnes' poll. He's going to come at a time when that lukewarm state is going to be there in the church. He's going to come at a time when, as it said, two out of three Americans don't believe in absolute moral truth anymore. And in that environment is when he opportunizes, and that's what comes in. So when we're dealing with this on the precepts of the kingdom, um, these are absolute moral truths that are found in Scripture that I want us to be aware of. Because, let me explain these to you. Jesus said that you would know the truth and the truth will make you free. Can we see the implied reverse of that? That if you don't know the truth, you remain in bondage or you go deeper into bondage. So truth sets free, but the absence of truth keeps in bondage. It, it keeps the pattern going in the same direction all the time without a change, or it gets worse. One of the two. But knowing the truth will break the pattern, break the cycle, break you out of that, and then move you forward into freedom, which is to, into a deeper revelation or deeper agreement with God's Word. So when we're talking about a precept, a precept is simply this. It's a binding rule or structure within the kingdom that directly relates to an outcome. So this kingdom that the Lord has set up for us is a kingdom that will never change because God's word never changes. His kingdom is set up upon his word, the structure of his word. So let's go on with this. All precepts are established by the authority of God. In other words, you, you can't take and create something that God, didn't, that God didn't put into the kingdom. Let me give you an example. In Catholicism, there's a teaching of, called purgatory, where if you didn't quite make it, you can go halfway, get all that burned up out of your system, you know, and then you can go on forward, which is basically to say there's another route to get there. So the Lord doesn't teach that. It doesn't say that you have to con confess your sins to a priest in Catholicism. It does say confess your sins one to another that you might be healed, but it doesn't say it's got to be to a priest. There is no precedence in the, in the Bible that says that you can go to what they call patron saints and ask for their intercession. You can't, as an example, pray to Mary and think that Mary is going to make intercession. She was a human being just like you and I, limited in skill, and highly honored, but limited in skill. So those created things, those literal precepts that are embraced in Catholicism are, is not what God is going to endorse. So there's no freedom in that, but there is an ongoing deception in it. So how many prayers have been offered to Mary hoping that there would be an intervention? Well, they can't get answered because Mary can't answer prayers. She's a sinner that needed Jesus just like you and I did. So all precepts are established by the authority of God and are bound by the immutable law of this one right here. It's called the sowing and the reaping. So there are two things in all these precepts that we want to embrace. And listen carefully. Everything in the Word of God, everything in here, is based upon two things. Number one, the authority of God. It's got to be God's Word. If it's not God's Word, then it's not authority of God. Number two, the compliance to that which produces either sowing, it, it does produce, it will always produce, sowing and reaping. So the failure to obey God's Word is a sowing and reaping. The blessing of obeying God's Word is a sowing and reaping. So the sowing and weep, reaping is a neutral law what changes the outcome of sowing and reaping is whether you're in obedience or whether you're in disobedience. That's what that is. So if, in order for us to advance forward into the kingdom, we have to advance forward into the revelation, the understanding of what the kingdom's like. If you don't know what the kingdom is, and you're viewing the kingdom through a religious posture, you're viewing the kingdom not through the word of God, but through a sense of personal equity, this is right, this is wrong. This is how I feel. That, we're back to that, what I talked about, the Machiavellian, what they showed with the current poll was that two out of three Americans don't believe in absolute moral truth, so now we believe in a sense of cultural truth. We're shaped in that. So, and, and for an example, this is what we do in our Christianity. 
We are products, whether we want to admit it or not, we are products of, of American culture. That's the country we were raised in. Those are the values that we were, that were put into our hearts. We are Americans, okay? Thank you, the Lord, that you get to be American. You're one in 400,000 odds of being born American in the world. And there are some people who believe in different nations that America is the second heaven. So we're blessed already to be Americans, but at the same time, dictates within our culture have a tendency to bleed over into the kingdom of God where we don't know where the lines divide. So then we start to behave according to the values of our culture rather than what does the kingdom of God say. Okay, let me give you an opposite thinking position. All right, so here we're coming into a time that I hear that they're officially going to uh, announce that we are in um, recession um, in July. That's what I've heard that there's going to be an announcement on that. That we're now coming into a recession. We're going to come into that point period. So prices, as you know, gas is, has more than doubled at the pumps. Okay. Food has gotten up 30%. I can't believe the, the cost of foods anymore when we go to the grocery store, how off crazy they are. And we're all feeling the crunch of this uh, failed administrative position under Biden and things that he could correct but simply won't. We're feeling that. Okay, every single American, every time you go to the pump, you're paying a price you didn't have to pay. It's just basically a policy that's making you pay this. All right, so now what's happening is that every single American is now being victimized, it's just, if we can say it this way, by an administration in the government that is godless and has no regard to the decency of a moral fiber. So now we turn around and we say, okay, well, what will I do to compensate? So we get everything we can, we start gathering, we start holding, we start in fear sometimes, gathering food, stockpiling things, and guess what happens? We end up, start, we end up to start giving less. Then we, then we become part of this trend that's happening in America where the Bible says that the love of many will grow cold and lawlessness will abound. So now we're victims of a lawless and of increasing lawlessness, and we can see that and prove that statistically in our own city. Increasing lawlessness is off the charts like never before in the city. And now because of that, our suspicions grow up, go up, our guardedness takes place, we're now starting to internalize where we start to be less giving, and that's all because we are not looking at the kingdom. We're looking at our own, our own life, our circle of life. But if we were looking at the dictates of the kingdom, then we would say, I know that love will grow cold and lawlessness will abound, but I am not going to be a lawless person. I'm going to be a loving person. I'm going to speak the truth in love, as hard as that may be sometimes, but I'm going to speak the truth in love. I'm going to speak that truth. That she said the other day, he goes, it's not love if you don't speak the truth to people. It's not really love if you don't tell them the truth, no matter how hard it hurts. When the Prince of Peace said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And to bring that sword into families, and it's going to divide families. And yet Jesus says that's love, to speak the truth. So we have the, the many faces of love. We see one view, we get tended toward one focus, but we don't realize that the multi, multiple views of the faces of love, what they really are. Now watch how this works. So because we're having, we're having a view on the kingdom is one thing, and then our culture is another thing, and we're in lawlessness, and then we're in this place where the love of many is growing cold, growing cold then we are a hyper stand of God, being guarded, and the consequence of it is we are seeing the, the kingdom through the lens of our culture rather than the absolution of the kingdom itself. And that's what we can't afford to do. We cannot afford that. We have got to isolate the kingdom and say we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom and the values and the precepts of this kingdom is what's going to produce our freedom and our peace. It's not going to be our culture. The culture is going to fail. But the kingdom is not. So as we look at the way the kingdom of God operates in the face of a changing culture, that will determine in the day's future whether we're going to continue in our prosperity with the Lord and our peace 
and our strength or whether we're going to be in and out and in and out with fear and all kinds of different things hitting us. So again, all precepts are based upon the authority of God and the sowing and reaping, which is the equation of obedience or disobedience. Now watch how this works. So examples of precepts. We have the laws of use. You know, and we see that both in the natural and the spiritual. If you apply these words, the, the laws of the precepts, into use, if you apply them in your life, then you will see a continual trickling in of those benefits into your life. In other words, guard your mouth. Don't speak fear. Don't speak those kinds of things over your life. Speak what God says about the kingdom over your life. So it's a law, that's one example of using the kingdom and being lined up with the way the kingdom lines up with. So we have the laws of faithfulness. There's nothing that you can accomplish in the kingdom of God or in the natural without being faithful. And faithful is to be consistent at something. You have the laws of stewardship. Do you rightly use these things in laws of stewardship? How, how are you a steward with your money? Are you, you know, Jesus after feeding the 5,000 and he created it with a few loaves of fish, what did he do? They gathered up all the pieces so that nothing would be wasted. You see Jesus operating in that stewardship. When he was God, he goes, well, you know what? A few fish, a few loaves. We didn't really lose much. Look at all this has gained. If we come to a problem again, we'll just get some more fish and keep multiplying. That wasn't his attitude. His attitude was make sure, gather the pieces up so that nothing is wasted. So our laws of stewardship, how we, how we take care of those things, both in the spirit and in the natural of those things that God has given to us. It's pretty important. Laws of endurance. You don't need to endure, which means to, to practice patience under pain. That's what endurance is, is to practice your patience under pain. You don't need to endure where there's no pain. You can just, well, but there are trying and testings, and you're in a spiritual environment where Satan is going to test everything you've got. And the Lord is going to test everything you've got. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. Count on that. That's a promise in God's Word. It can't fail. Everything. Now, when it starts, when everything is in the process of shaking, it will require endurance to stay aligned with the truth and say, my God's faithful. If it falls to the left or it falls to the right, or the economy or the government fails and different things happen all around me, what happens if my faith is, is shaken to the ground? I've got to make sure that, you know, my eyes are on Jesus. So all that stuff is going to be shaken, both natural and spiritual. But it will require endurance to keep on. And to be looking not so much at the storms around you, but look vertical to God above you. The laws of gain and loss. These are all laws that are within the kingdom. Laws of pairing. You ever heard of laws of pairing before? It's in the scripture, actually. It says you're not to be unequally yoked. Righteousness with unrighteousness. Dark with light. You're not to be unequally yoked. There are laws of pairing that are found in the scripture. And when you violate the laws of pairing... <coughs> then you end up bringing something into your life that's not supposed to be there. Laws of exchange. Everything that you do is based upon the principle of exchange. That's in the Lord. So what happens? You offer Jesus your asset, or your, excuse me, you offer Jesus your failures, but what you do is he gives you his assets. Amen. Is that thing bothering you there? That The hum that's coming out of that? Are you okay with that? Or is it bothering you? Okay. All right. So the laws of exchange, everything that Jesus does is we're constantly offering Christ our liabilities and he is off and then he exchanges his life and gives us his assets. So truth, being set free by truth is when you literally give God your liabilities and then the Lord gives you your tr the truth. He says, now practice this truth and walk in this truth. And it will deliver you from your liability and grant you into your assets. That's what it does, the virtues. So the laws of agreement. Wherever two or more gather together in my name is agreeing to anything, he says it will be done for them. Well, because agreement has power. Well, on the dark side of that, agreement by darkness creates power too, but in a negative way. So agreement is neutral. It depends on what the factors are that bring it together. So those are just some of those. And we're going to go through these later on. Not today, of course, but that's just the headlines of some of the precepts in the kingdom. 
As I said, everything in the kingdom of God is based upon two things, sowing and reaping, how you practice the laws of God, and the authorities that God gives to us. Everything is based upon those. God's authority, he said, not one jot or tittle will disappear from my, world, my word. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. That means all things are subject to God's word. All things are changing. All things are turning. But God's word does not. And if you understand the word of the Lord, then wisdom, watch this now, wisdom is what God gives to rightly apply the knowledge of his truth. So when you have a circumstance, you may have a precept as an example of law of exchange. But okay, now you're in a situation, and God is going to give you wisdom on how to practice the law of exchange so it works to your benefit. So you're in a situation, laws of pairing. So you're going to recognize when a pairing is right and when a pairing is wrong. You're going to recognize that. And wisdom is going to give you the ability to call certain things out of your life that shouldn't be there versus things that should be there. Amen? So the kingdom of God is established in immutable, watch this, unchangeable principles by which we exercise the faith given to us by God. Now stop and think about this for a second. The operation of your faith is absolutely reliable based upon the unchangeable sense of God's Word. Now follow what I'm saying with you, okay? Faith does not, I mean, it's a teaching by itself, but faith is a divine substance that God gives to you. It's not something that you're created with, you're not born with that. Okay, that's a misconception. I run into this all the time in Africa, and we do a lot of teaching on that. Faith is a divine substance. By faith, for by faith you have been saved through grace, Grace, if faith is not of yourselves, is something that God gives you. It didn't come by works so that nobody can boast. That's what Ephesians 2.8 says. So when I am looking at something, God has given me faith in His Word. Faith in His Word to believe everything He says. Faith to hear the reign of God and believe what He says. All right? Follow what I'm saying here now. So my faith is paired. Here we go with that law of pairing. My faith is paired with God's Word. Now, when my faith is paired with God's word, then what comes out of that is the substance of what God will bring forth into my life. I follow what I'm saying here. I cannot pair my faith with something else that's not God's word or not the truth. When I try to do that, it produces error, and error will always bring you into bondage. You follow what I'm saying, okay? So when we take this authority of the kingdom, the, the wonderful thing that gives us peace and comfort and confidence is that I know that God's word cannot fail. I know that. When he said to Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you turn again, go back and strengthen your brethren. Now watch what happens here. This is what takes place. My confidence is that if God said it and I do it, it will happen. That's my confidence. I don't put a time on it, and I can't put a method on it, because that's the wisdom that belongs to God. And He sometimes will reveal that. But I can absolutely know for sure that God is going to do this. My wife has been dealing with pain in her mouth for a year. Guess what the law of endurance is? Here you go. It's got to kick in. Okay? Guess what the law of pairing is? God's word to the faith that God's given to her. Now we have this assurance. So now we're going to go into the battle with this endurance. We're going to praise God. We're going to thank God. Because that's what the law of thanksgiving is. Give thanks in all things. For this is the will. That is to give thanks in all things. For you in Christ Jesus. He didn't say give thanks for all things. He said in all things give thanks for this is the will of the Lord for you in Christ Jesus. Why? Why would I give thanks in all circumstances? Well, because God's in it. And my eyes aren't on the circumstances. My, God, my eyes are on God who delivers. My eyes are on God who justifies. My eyes are upon the Lord and what He will do. My eyes are upon God who can't be changed. My eyes are upon God who can't be manipulated. My eyes are upon God whose immutable righteousness is given to nobody but for all people to conform to. My eyes are upon God who will perform the signs and wonders and miracles. My eyes are upon God who has all these promises for me. That's why, I have, that's why I have peace and confidence. Because God has given me a faith that I can pair with His Word and know that God is going to answer my prayers and bring about justice. Amen? Amen.
So if you are afflicted with sickness or disease in your body, be encouraged. Be encouraged. As you offer a prayer before the Lord, it can't fail. God will heal you. The Lord will heal you. He will answer your prayer. If you're in a circumstance, God will come in. The, the wonderful thing is that God's authority is not flexed for you, it's not flexed for any man. It is his absolute authority and it never changes. And that's why your faith will work. Amen. So Luke 16, 8 says this. For the sons of this age, Jesus gave this parable, are more shrewd in relation to their own than the sons of light. He says we come out of the world knowing the world well, but we come into the kingdom not knowing it so well. And we have these things in the kingdom that are opposite to the things in the world. So in the place of fear, in the place of lack, where there's leanness, where there's things going on, like say in the market today, there's fear. And people are internalizing. But the, what's the Lord say? He goes, if you want to increase, he says, give out, don't bring in. So the Dead Sea has what? Water coming in, but no water going out. The Sea of Galilee has water going in, water going out. Our lives ought to be outward expressions of the inward work. So that we have water coming in and works coming out. We have the Spirit coming in and then a works coming out. We're not saved by works, but there's an expression of something that happens to you. When you line with Jesus and His Word comes in, then you dance to a new song. Amen? When His Word comes in, freedom comes in, and you're not doing what you did before. Now, you're walking in the freedom of the Lord. So the works become something different than what you did before. You got delivered from bondage, and now you're walking into the freedom. That's how this kingdom operates. So he said, but you've got to know what this kingdom is. If you don't know what the precepts are, you can't enter into them, nor can you practice them. So he said the sons of this age and the natural are wiser about how things work in the natural than they are about how they work in the spiritual. And we all come in, maybe experts in the, in the natural world. We may be a corporate executive of GMC. It doesn't make any difference. You could be the top of the top of the business entrepreneur list. You may be the president of the United States. But if you don't know the kingdom, then you don't have any freedom. You're caught in that dog-eat-dog -dog world, and the kingdom of God is just the opposite in many parts of thinking. There are laws that parallel to both. But to understand how the precepts of the kingdom work is uniquely different. So Colossians says this, For by him, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Things that you can't see. What about the law of forgiveness? What about the law of unforgiveness? What about the law of bitterness? The law of bitterness says in Hebrews it said that if there's anything bitter among you, a root will spring up within you and thereby poison many. That's what it talks about law of bitterness as an example. What about the law of increase? Well, that law of increase says that there's one who gives and he increases more. There's one who withholds more, more than what is just and, he, and his life leads to poverty. So you talk about that. So those are laws, visible and invisible. You can't see those laws. You can't see the law of pairing, but you can see the results of it. You can't see the law of, of, uh, of exchange, but you can see the fruit that comes out of it. Visible and invisible, thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now look at He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. This means, watch this, this means that the kingdom of God is not going to change. This means that the precepts of God do not change. They don't vacillate. They don't switch. Good times, bad times, cultures, nations, continents, languages, doesn't make any difference. This law never changes for all things because he holds all that together. He created this kingdom. He created this kingdom for you and I to be a part of and said no matter where you go, no matter who you meet, no matter what you do, no matter where your culture, no matter where you travel to, the laws remain the same. Amen. And no matter where you go. Romans says this. Now we're going to break this down just for a second here. Watch this. Every person is to be in subject to the governing authorities. Now I want to change and challenge your thinking on something here for a second, okay? What are governing authorities? Well, we naturally think of governing authorities as personalities and people. Police officers, governors, presidents, whatever it may be. We think of governing authorities in those terms. The New American Standard Bible translates Romans 13 in a different way than, your regular, than other translations do. 
Let me set this, the tone on this one. Romans 13, according to the New American Standard translation, does not express this passage in personalities, but rather, rather as a dynamic. So understand the difference here, okay? We're not talking about governing authorities as in people who sit in offices. Now, it can lead to that, but the primary weight of this thing is not personalities. The primary weight is how this reflects the kingdom. And he's talking about governing authorities of the kingdom. Watch it. Visible and invisible. Thrones, dominions, kingdoms. So as an example, who is the prince that stands watch over Israel? God's organized that in the kingdom and dominion. That's Michael the archangel, Daniel chapter 12. For the scripture says, for Daniel, the prince who stands watch over your people. He's, he's designated Daniel over, or excuse me, he's designated Michael the archangel over Israel. I don't know who the angel is over America. But God has assigned angels over every single country. And guess what? Satan has tried to copy that. So he had his, he had his, his dominions of darkness as assigned to his purpose over every country as well. They're, these wicked spirits in heavenly places are not just randomly up there. They're functioning in an order. And that's what we have to understand. We don't know that. We can't see anything except for the fruits of their works on the earth. But they are there. And they're there to do harm. As God's angels, which are sent to ministering servants, are there to do good for us. So every person is to be in subjection to governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Now think of these not as people in positions, but think of these as the dynamics of the kingdom of God and what makes the kingdom work. Okay? Those immutable laws, those precepts. Think of those authorities in that, in that way. Therefore, whoever resists authority, not the one in authority, as your translation might say, but whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who who have op opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So watch how this works. If I take and see the word of God that says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, and I violate that, and then I go into business with someone who is an unbeliever, I have violated the precept of the law of pairing. Okay, now watch, watch, how, watch this carefully. Now I want God to bless my business. Guess what God's not going to do? He's not going to bless the unbeliever with the believer. You follow what I'm saying? Now, for the sake of the believer, he can do that, but not for the sake of the unbeliever. Let me give you an example of that. Joseph is in the house of Potiphar, and God wants to bless Joseph. Potiphar's house became orderly, but the blessing stayed on Joseph. When Joseph left, the blessing left, and it left Potiphar's house as well. Then as Joseph went into the, to the prison, the blessings of Joseph put the prison into order again. And in, in a certain sense, but when Joseph left the prison, the order of the blessing left the prison and went to the throne of Pharaoh. So it's where you are, you're the one by which God blesses, but when you leave, the blessing goes with you. You take that with you is what happens. Amen. If it's done in the right order, in the right way. So when we talk about resisting authority who has opposed the ordinance of God, that means you violate a precept. You violate a place in the word of God. Okay? Blessed is the man, watch this, who does not turn his back upon the poor. The Bible says he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord and God will repay. That's what that says. If you read Isaiah about changing circumstances in a person's life. I heard the testimony of this lady. She was sick. And he says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen, that you share your bread with the poor? And then your light will shine upon you, and the glory of the Lord will shine upon you. See what this woman did? She, she was dying of cancer. So she followed that word, that precept in Isaiah, and she went out and she spent the next two months just making bags of lunches and meals and going to the homeless people and to the needy people and handing out food. On, and every time she did, she goes, I'm healed too. I'm healed. I'm healed. And when she did that, guess what? She was healed. It was a miracle. Because she followed that precept of the word of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So if they ignore, as an example, the law of pairing, then that condemnation is that, that they're going to violate something and then they're going to be brought into bondage. 
Every time there's a violation of the Word of God, it never produces freedom. It will always, always, invariably produce bondage. Please understand that. Any violation of God's Word is a bondage maker. Every compliance to God's Word is a freedom maker. And that's the absolute morals that the rest of the world doesn't want to acknowledge. So, resist and oppose. What does that word resist mean? This is interesting because this is going to be some words that you're going to be familiar with. It means to set up in a formal array in order to reject. So there's a, first there's a set up in a formal array, okay? And it's the word that we get the word antihistamine. Does that sound familiar to you when you take a cold medicine? You take an antihistamine from it comes from this word in the Greek. And it means to set up against, a formal set up against. So if you don't want to have, as an example, nasal congestion, you will take an antihistamine, which is to resist the congestion. And that's what happens. And then the word oppose is to now, after you have set your position, is to now stand against it. Okay? So we find that word, having done all you can to resist the enemy, to stand, then stand there for, or to oppose. So when you take these words, resist and oppose, as we're back there, who resists authority and has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed it, now this is to carry out the resistance. You set up a formal, watch how this works, you set up a formal position, an array against something, and then you stand and you oppose it. It's antihistamine and histamine, two different words in the Greek. So when I'm setting up something against the word of God, and I'm, and I'm violating the word of God, and I'm setting up an opposition against it, that is called antihistamine. And now as I carry out that opposition, it's called histamine, or to oppose it, and to carry it out. So, verse 3, as we go on in, in Romans there, it says, For rulers are not a cause for fear for good behavior, but for evil. It, it, one would read that and think we're again still talking about people. We're not. Watch what rulers does. Do you want them to have no fear? That word fear is where we get the word phobos or phobia. And it literally means in the Greek terror. You want to have no terror of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. Look, this word rulers in the Greek literally is the word archon. It means first in rank or power. Now listen to what I'm saying to you. Watch how this works. In Romans 13, these rulers that God has put into his creation that we read in Colossians 1.16... For by him all things were created, both visible and invisible, kings, thrones, and dominions. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. That right there, the rulers that come into the visible and invisible, watch, natural. Uh, one is called what? Gravity. That's a natural ruler. It's never going to change in America. It's never going to change in the world. Okay, so we have this thing. Uh, mathematics. Mathematics are consistent. I don't care what country you go to, 2 plus 2 is still 4. doesn't make any difference. All right, so now watch how this works. These are natural. Those are visible. The invisible. If you don't forgive, guess what? You can't be... That's a law. You can't break that law. You can't hold unforgiveness toward any person or you yourself cannot be forgiven. Now watch how this works. Because when you hold unforgiveness, you violate the primary tenet of the kingdom, which is based on two things, giving and forgiving. All right? For God gave his only begotten son that we could be forgiven of our sins. Giving and forgiving. Everything in the kingdom is based upon that. So God says, if you violate the very core of the ordinance of the kingdom, that is to, you must walk in the forgiveness that you have been given as well, then the heavens are sealed and God says, we're going to only deal with one issue that's all I'm talking to you about. We're not dealing with any of the, oh Lord, you know, bless me with this, or Lord, help me with that, or God, heal me with this. And God says, nope, we're talking about one thing. What is it, Lord, that you forgive? Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. That's what it talks about doing. All right, so what if I don't want to confess my faults one to another? What if I don't want to? <clears throat> and I have need of healing. Guess what the implied reverse is? I'm violating a law of forgiveness and it holds me in the state of sickness that I deal with. Now those are immutable laws. It sounds too simplistic, but those things are true. So these rulers that God has put into the kingdom, remember what that started out with? That there are all the ordinances and the authorities of God are established by God? 
That's these rules that the Lord talked about, or the rulers that are established in Romans 13. Someone said to me one time, um, that doesn't mean that at all. That's about civil order. I said, really? I said, then are you telling me that America was founded upon violation of Romans 13? Because we rebelled against the king. And if we are in violation of Romans 13 as a nation because we rebelled against the king of England when we were starting this country, then we really can't expect to be blessed, can we? Because we violated Romans 13 and the foundation is wrong from the, rule up, from, the, from the ground up. I said, it doesn't apply to that. What are we going to do with Antichrist? Are we going to say that Antichrist is established as a ruler and therefore we must obey? Or Hitler or Stalin or Mussolini or Mao Zedong? No, it doesn't mean that at all. He's not talking about people in positions of authority in Romans 13. He's talking about his kingdom and the rules of that kingdom. And in compliance to those rules. Look, look, look. For now it, not he, your translation might say he. If you have King James, New King James, it'll say he. But the word in the in New American Standard is it. Because it's talking about a dynamic of authority. For it is a minister of God to you. Authority is a minister of God to you for good. Why? Why is that true? Because if I know that God's word is immutable and it can't change, it gives me substance to stand on and a reliability that if I do what God says, God said he will do it. it it's not spongy. It's not gray. It's not situational ethics. It's an absolution of the kingdom. That's what that is. So when I'm looking at God's word, I have to be able to read God's word with such confidence that I can say, if God said he would do this, then he will do this. If God's word said this is what will happen, then it will happen. If God says if you take the mark of the beast, then you will not have salvation. You're eternally sealed unto damnation. If God says if you violate this rule, then this is what will take place. So we have to know that, that God's word cannot be changed. So it's a minister to you for good. That gives you standing reliability and confidence that when you pray according to God's word, something is going to happen if you fall into compliance with it. But if you do what is evil, that is you violate God's word, be afraid. It's the only place in the scripture he tells Christians to be afraid. Most of the time, 360 sometimes, he says, fear not. But in this one, he says, be afraid. For it, that is, the authority does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Now listen to what I'm saying to you. There is a certain aspect of ignorance in things that we do that we come into discovery. And we're in this place of grace with God. Because I'm ignorant of something about the kingdom. I want to come into something, into the prosperity and the benefits of the kingdom. There's no malice in my heart. It's just that I'm ignorant of what happens in the application of this particular precept or something. So, I'll never forget one time, I was working as a bartender in a college town, and, but I didn't drink. I, I didn't drink at all. I didn't do smoke, dope, I didn't drink, and yet here I am a bartender in this bar. And a friend of mine, a man who would take me under his wing, came up to me one time, he says, Don, he goes, you don't drink, do you? I said, no, uh-uh, nope. He goes, but you bartend, don't you? And I said, yeah. He says, do you know what the Word of God says about that? I'm a brand new Christian. I said, no, what? So he takes me to the places where it says, I think it's in, I, I, I can't remember the exact address. I'm, I'm thinking it's in Proverbs. It says, woe unto him who gives his neighbor the drink that causes him to be drunk and then looks upon his, his shamedness for violence will overcome him. So the guy that is shoving the drinks across the bar to the person who's drinking, the penalty comes upon the bartender who looks upon the shame, the nakedness and the shame of his guy's intoxication. And the Bible says that the violence will overcome him who supplies the drink. I went, I said, Dennis, I said, I didn't know about that. He goes, yeah. He says, I didn't think you did. You know what I did? I walked into the bar that night, said to my boss, I said, I have to quit. I can't give you two weeks notice. I have to quit right now. Right now. I had no job lined up where I was going to be able to pay for my rent or all the costs. All I knew is that I can't do this. I have got to walk away from this. Now I did it for that, for that reason, for the Word of God, and it scared me. That the next day, 
I had a job working for the city of Riverton that was better pay, daytime hours. I didn't smell like a cigarette ever at 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm closing at the bar. My eyes burning, my clothes smelling like cigarette smoke. And I was out of that environment and I got a normal life with a better job and everything. Worked. You know, but the first thing that was required is that I had to obey God's word to come into that blessing that God had stored for me. It was interesting. But I, there I was in ignorance not knowing that that rule of law was applied to me. And when I found out what it was, I know they came into obedience to it and God, God blessed me. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices it. I thank God that God brings into point of focus judgment. What if he didn't? What if, what if we weren't disciplined in the Lord? What if, we, what if this society that we live in was never checked by God? What if the Lord didn't bring to light those who practice evil? Then evil would have a free license to move as it was and our lives would be destroyed. When you see things brought out into the light and things brought forward, it's the Lord. It's not the enemy exposing himself. It's the Lord exposing. Look at this. So these were practices. Passo, it means to, to perform repetitively or habitually by implication. That means to execute something. So when you're practicing something, you're doing something consistently. Have you ever asked yourself this question? I've seen it in people's lives. Why do people cyclically keep going through the same thing over and over and over again? Why do certain ministries never rise to a certain altitude? Why do they stay where they're at? And they keep practicing entry, exit, entry, exit, entry, exit, entry, exit. Why is that? Because they leave these laws behind in the precepts and they can never get off the ground. They are doomed to something because if you go back again to the practices that they have in their philosophy of their own personal justice, you find that they are practicing these things and that they bring and incur a curse upon themselves. Let me give you an example of that in scripture. So you have Manasseh. Manasseh was an evil king. Manasseh comes after Hezekiah. Hezekiah was reputed to be one of the best kings of Israel. He had, his life actually had, had more fruit in it than King David did. He was a, 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 in a, by far a, a prospering king. David would later on become the standard that God would say, if you'll serve me like your father David did, because David has such a humble heart before the Lord. So after Hezekiah, then comes Manasseh. And Manasseh turns the whole nation against God, creating abominations that were worse than the pagans before and around them. Where he, he brought, practiced the sacrifice, sacrifice of children, putting them on Moloch. Moloch was this cone-shaped god that had an open belly in which they would put this fire into this thing and had arms that looked like this on it, just a flat plane across the top, and this wolf-looking like face. And there were, they would build this oven until it would turn orange red. And then they would take their children, as they call, call it passing through the fire, and they'd take these newborn babies and they would put them on the arms of Moloch and it would just talk and sizzle the children and fry them unto death. And they were practicing that in Israel from the knowledge of God in his glory. And he turned that whole nation against God. And then what happens is that Manasseh gets captured, he gets hooks put in his jaw, bronze hooks, and he's captured, his arms are tied behind him, and he's led into captivity in that state. So he's got these hooks coming out of his mouth, and he's being pulled along by a horse, and he goes into captivity. While he's in captivity, he humbles himself before God and calls on the name of the Lord, and God heard him. After all the damage he did, God heard him. So he comes back to Israel and he tries to turn the whole nation back to God again. He can't do it. He, as, as much as he tried, that root was sunk down so deep he couldn't reverse it. He could heal some things up, take out the altars and the high places. When you see that word, the high places, it meant people that were individual doing their own thing and what they decided they were, how they were going to worship God. That's what that meant. So he takes those things down, didn't work. Then Amnon follows in his place. And Amnon picked back up again. Even though Manasseh died repenting in the Lord, his son Amnon picked up where his father fell. Then after Amnon dies, then Josiah comes in the throne. Then there's 10 more years on the throne. Guess what happens? They are 57 years 
in apostasy before God. 57 years. And God says, there's going to be a reckoning on this. Josiah, because you served me, it's not going to happen in your days, but it's going to happen after you. And God brought that nation into servitude for 70 years by, Jer by, Je by the prophecy of Jeremiah. 70 years they were in captivity. Listen to what I'm saying to you. God brings this thing and checks those who practice evil. He'll bring, he'll bring penalty to you. He will do that. It's called the disciplines of the Lord. And it's not to disqualify you, but rather to turn you so that he can bless you. That's what that's for. When God deals with his children, and he deals with them in the sense of discipline, the end result is to get them lined up with God so he can bless them, so they can move them forward. If they don't, then they stay in that state. And then we enter into a Hebrew 6, six scenario, which is a sin unto death. And the sin unto death is not forgivable. So there is an, an ultimate penalty to that. These laws of pairing, sowing and reaping, please understand something. Going back to that little umbrella, and we're almost done here. Is that everything you do, every single thing you do, you're constantly sowing and you're constantly reaping. You cannot break that law. If you do not know what God's word is, you're still sowing. If you know what God's word is, you're still sowing. If you sow in ignorance like what Israel didn't know for 57 years that they were under a curse, it's because they were still sowing what Manasseh did and Amnon did, and even in part to Josiah's until he found out that there was a book in the kingdom of God, and Saphan the scribe brought it to him and says, we found this book. And he says, what does it say? And they read it to Josiah, and Josiah stood up after he heard the word of God and tore his clothes. He says, we are under a curse from God. No one knew it. That's how far, how distance they got. They didn't even know they were under a curse. Listen to me. Stop and think just for a second. Listen to me carefully now. Some of you have been in a holding pattern for way too long. Your promotion is scheduled. It's holding. It's there. It's for you. But you're overdue on your promotion. Your promotion in life. What is it you're calling out on the Lord to do? You want things to change. You want God to bless you. We all do. We need God's blessing. Each one of us do. But you've been in a holding pattern for too long. It's time for your promotion. It's time for you to go up to the next step. It's time to come out of that, that altitude of one circle that you're just going around and around and around in. And God says, it's there for you. That promotion's ready for you. I've already got it for you. It's there but you're going to have to take God's word and break this thing, whatever he's telling you to do, break it, and then step into the next level so that God can promote you. He wants to promote you. That's the, he will never promote you outside of the definitions of his word. His word is always going to be the substance by which he promotes you because you will know the truth, which is his word, and the truth will make you free. His word, his truth, is the same. They're one and the same. Freedom comes by his truth. Bondage comes by no truth. Or no obedience to the truth. So what we're doing all the time is that we are sowing and reaping. Look at Galatians says. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this is he, he will weep. Remember we talked about laws of pairing? You're going to see it in the laws of sowing and reaping. For the one who sows to his own flesh... From the flesh he will reap corruption. There's a pairing. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. There's a pairing. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. There's the law of endurance. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, laws of faithfulness, consistency, and especially those who are the household of faith. So you can see as you look at, if you're aware of these precepts, when you're reading scripture, the precepts will leap out at the page to you. Oh, that's the law of endurance. Okay, that's the law of use. Um, that's the law of the, the faithfulness. Hebrews literally says, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Ah, what are we seeing? Without endurance, 
You can't reach the promise. For you have need of endurance. It's Hebrews 10, 41, 42. If you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God in the practicing of his enduring with his practice, then you may receive the blessing. See what you're calling them out here? Can't, <laughs> there are some blessings you can't come into without endurance. You can't do it. Amen? You follow me? Okay. So this is important. We're going to go through these precepts and you're going to be blessed by them because you're going to understand what these precepts are so that when you read the scriptures, as you're reading them, these precepts will just start coming off the page and you're going to go, ah, all right, that's the, that's the principle of this. That's the precept of this. That's what this is. And you're going to be encouraged that you're going to go, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. One of the things about endurance that's required of us is this, watch this. Endurance requires a systematic approach of routines that are based upon that consistency. You see what I'm saying? Prayer. The study of God's Word. Doing those things consistently. The practice. He's talked about that practice. Those who practice evil. What about, what about those who practice righteousness? What about that consistency of practicing righteousness? Look what God has in store. Let me tell you something. We are going to come in, to, we are going to untap the treasures of God based upon what his word says and the blessings that are going to come out, you are going to be so surprised and come before the Lord and say, what am I practicing that is producing detriment to my life? What am I practicing that is producing blessings to my life? What wisdom do I need in the precepts of this that I'm going to apply these specifically into my life? Because knowing them is one thing. But you're going to have to have the wisdom to know where to apply them so that you can be the benefactor of them. Amen? Let's stand.